Allora, benvenuti a tutti e buonasera e ringraziamo Giulia per essere qui con noi e per aver accettato l'invito. Giulia, per chi non la conoscesse, eh, è stata una studentessa del Collegio Ghislieri e si è laureata all'Università di Pavia in Biologia nel 2010. Dopodiché ehm, è andata all'Università di Cambridge per il dottorato e in quel periodo la sua attività di ricerca si è concentrata per lo più sulla quadrupla elica di DNA e successivamente ha fatto il postdoc um, al Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory e adesso uh, è tornata a Cambridge e eh, la sua attività al momento uh, si concentra sul cancro al pancreas di cui ci parlerà stasera. Quindi Giulia lascio la parola a te. Grazie. Grazie per la presentazione. Non so riesco a scegliere. Si vede bene? Perfetto. Ok. Ok, allora, eh, grazie a tutti per per venire a sentire questa presentazione. E è sempre un piacere tornare in collegio, anche se virtualmente. E anche e soprattutto ringrazio Marta e <ride> gli organizzatori per uh, al, um, permettermi di dare questa presentazione in inglese, perché um, sarebbe un po' impossibile per me darla in italiano, purtroppo. Um, so, let's see if I can. Okay, so uh, with this, um, I, uh, we're going to talk today about one of my favorite uh, arguments, and I'm going to keep it quite uh, on the general level, but please, at the end, we will have time for some questions. So if you have some specific uh, uh, curiosity or something you want to know about, about the field, uh, I would be very happy to, to, uh, to answer your questions. But um, basically, I want to tell you a little bit about what we work in the laboratory and how we are trying to identify new therapies for a pancreatic cancer. And the uh, majority of, um, of research that is done in this, uh, in this field is trying to target the cancer cells themselves. And uh, my lab is taking a slightly different approach, uh, which is planning to combine targeting of cancer cells with targeting of non-cancerous components of pancreatic tumors. And I hope that during this talk, we'll appreciate why we think that that's important and will have an impact in patient benefit. So uh, before starting, I want to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we are um, a, a laboratory at the uh, Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. Uh, this is uh, my team. Uh, you can see them on the, on, the, on the right, Eloise and Joaquin, they are first year PhD students. They started last October, and I will tell you a little bit about their projects towards the end of the talk. Uh, Sara here is a, a research assistant in the lab, or as I like to call her, uh, she's the pillar of the lab. She keeps me sane and uh, get, makes everything run smoothly. And uh, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for her, she's uh, uh, starting her own PhD in Edinburgh in, in October. So J Judel is incoming and starting this summer to, um, to take her place. And Priscilla is a PhD student that's gonna join us in October. And I'll tell you about her project as well. We are funded by a number of charities and uh, funding bodies, and we are very grateful to them because they allow us to do the science that we like to do and that we think will have an impact in the future. So uh, why do we work on pancreatic cancer? Well, if you look at statistics for a number of malignancies over the past decades, you will see that uh, we have done quite a good job for a number of cancer types, and we have significantly improved the, the five-year survival rate for many cancer patients. Unfortunately, this is not true for pancreatic cancer patients, in particular for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is the type of pancreatic cancer that we study in the lab and that it's the most common and the most lethal among the pancreatic cancer. You can see here from these graphs that really over four or five decades, we haven't done much to improve the survival of the patients. And this graph will look the same this year when this graph would be updated. 
So why is that? Why pancreatic cancer patients have such a poor prognosis? Well, there's a number of reasons. And perhaps uh, one of the main reasons is the fact uh, that it doesn't let me go on is the fact that um, the majority of pancreatic cancer patients are, um, every time that people enter, I can't do anything, <laughs> are diagnosed at late stage. So they present with metastatic disease, so with the tumors spread around their bodies. And these patients, unfortunately, are not eligible for surgery, for, so for the removal of their pancreatic primary tumor. And so far, surgery is really the only curative option for pancreatic patients. So why is that the case? Why do pancreatic cancer patients uh, um, get diagnosed at such a late stage? Well, also for that, there's a number of reasons. Um, this is typically an asymptomatic disease until late stage. So you can have a tumor that is growing in your pancreas and you really don't know until it's too late. Um, the other obvious reason is that I hope you know where your pancreas is, but clearly is not in a position that is uh, visible and uh, that can be reached easily. And also there's no screening methods. So for a number of cancer types, melanoma, breast cancer, colon cancer, we now have uh, uh, screening methods that allow early detection of the disease. And this has been a massive contributor in extending the survival for several patients. Unfortunately, this is not true for pancreatic cancer patients, and talking about this could be a whole lesson in itself. And so uh, why is that the case? Well, we don't have uh, biomarkers uh, to detect the disease, like blood biomarkers. We don't have uh, uh, routine imaging techniques to detect uh, early detect or early stage of the, of the cancer. And uh, also, even if uh, we will end up having an early detection method that is like 99.9% .9 specific and selective for the disease, uh, still, uh, um, we likely won't be able to uh, uh, use it over the general population. And the reason for that is that uh, while pancreatic cancer is responsible for um, the, one of the large majority of uh, cancer death worldwide, it's still a relatively rare disease uh, uh, compared to other cancer types such as breast cancer and colon cancer. And so um, it wouldn't be possible to perform large screening uh, um, as, as such uh, on the general population because you would still have a really uh, high rate of um, uh, false positives. And also it would be extremely expensive um, for the detection of the few patients that you would detect in this way. But again, this is a much more complicated uh, um, uh, subject. So what, uh, what happens if you are a pancreatic cancer patient with a metastatic disease? Well, um, you have some therapeutic options, but unfortunately, they are uh, not very effective. So we don't have uh, uh, regimens uh, that are curative when you are at a late stage. And uh, um, there's a couple of uh, main uh, approved regimens. One is called fulfirinox, and um, perhaps slightly better than the gemabraxin one. Um, but fulfirinox is more toxic, so not everyone can get fulfirinox. And this is particularly true because uh, the majority of pancreatic cancer patients are old people over 70 years old people. And so not everyone is eligible for this and uh, can't uh, take it well and the side effects are, are several. So this is another reason why pancreatic cancer patients do so poorly, but it's not just the only one. There's an additional reason, which is the fact that these tumors are also highly chemotherapy resistant. And also for this, there's a series of reasons. Uh, one of these is uh, the presence of an extensive microenvironment, uh, which is uh, the subject of, uh, of this talk and uh, the focus of my laboratory. And so um, we, while we have done a significant improvement in understanding the biology of the tumor, the focus has really been in understanding the genetic and epigenetic changes of the pancreatic cancer cells. 
And it's now emerging and more and more clear that by just looking at the biology of uh, pancreatic cancer cells, we have a very limited understanding of the biology of the whole tumor and a very limited picture of pancreatic cancer biology. And so in our lab, we are interested in studying the non-cancerous cells of pancreatic tumors, which actually comprise up to 90% of the overall tumor mass. So you can imagine that one of the deadliest cancer types actually can have in its tumors as little as 10% comprised by the malignant mutated epithelial cancer cells. And the majority is comprised by uh, normal cells that are reprogrammed reprogram and hijacked by the cancer cells to become tumor promoting and to promote chemotherapy resistance. And so my lab is interested in understanding the biology of non-cancerous cells and how non-cancerous cells interact with the pancreatic cancer cells and how we can stop this interaction to develop new therapies. Within the non-cancerous cells, my laboratory focus is on uh, fibroblasts, which are the uh, uh, most abundant cell population in pancreatic tumors, uh, and they are uh, responsible uh, for the deposition of this uh, um, uh, extracellular matrix and collagen that you see here represented by this blue ocean that, that uh, surrounds these little islands of uh, cancer cells. And the fact that cancer-associated fibroblasts or CAS are um, the most abundant uh, population is not the only reason why we are interested in uh, this particular cell type. But where are CAS coming from? Well, in the, in the lab, we are um, uh, mostly working with uh, fibroblasts, pancreatic fibroblasts, and pancreatic stellate cells. Stellate cells are a specialized fibroblast type, and they're only present in the pancreas and in the liver. And uh, uh, these are the, um, the cell types that we use the most, maybe because uh, I'm more conservative and just for this uh, about the fact that the cancer-associated fibroblast is coming from uh, a fibroblast. But actually, a number of studies, mostly in vitro, uh, have shown that uh, uh, many cell types can actually acquire uh, features of a calf, calf-like features in the context of uh, a tumor. And so you have pericytes, which are the cells that align the vasculature, endothelial cells themselves, adipocytes, epithelial cells, and mesothelial cells. Uh, and uh, a number of cell types from the bone marrow have been shown to be recruited and reprogrammed by cancer cells to um, become calves. And how do calves become calves? Well, uh, again, uh, there are uh, various mechanisms. Uh, in my lab, we are particularly interested in understanding how the cancer cells themselves reprogram fibroblasts and stellate cells to become a calf through ligands or uh, juxtacrine interactions. But there's a, a number of other uh, studies that have shown that metabolic reprogramming is very important, oxidative stress, uh, and also uh, stromal cues, stromal cues from the immune cells, but also from the calf themselves. There's also reprogramming at the transcriptional level and uh, epigenetic changes. Uh, and we are actually um, gonna look at that uh, in Priscilla's project. And what do cats do? Well, they do, uh, uh, they play several roles in uh, tumors, uh, in pancreatic tumors, but also in other cancer types. As mentioned, they are uh, the, um, the main, uh, they, they deposit the extracellular matrix or ECM, which in itself has several functions. Uh, ECM has been shown to provide uh, mechanical cues that activate specific tumor promoting signaling pathways in the cancer cells and promote tumor growth. But also uh, specific ECM components have been shown to provide nutrients for the cancer cells. And also, uh, they are recognized uh, to um, represent a barrier to drug delivery, which leads as a consequence to therapy resistance, which is, as I mentioned previously, one of the main features of uh, pancreatic tumors. But CAFs themselves in pancreatic cancer have been shown to actively contribute to therapy resistance, for example, by uh, uh, scavenging gemcitabine, which is the standard of care, and, and uh, overall reducing, lowering the concentration of the drug within the tumor so that um, cancer cells are less affected. 
Cas have also been shown to secrete uh, ligands that uh, actively promote tumor growth and metastasis formation, and also have been shown to uh, be largely responsible for the establishment of an immunosuppressive microenvironment in pancreatic cancer, but also in other malignancies, for example, by preventing recruitment of cytotoxic T cells. And so you can appreciate why, for all of these reasons, CAFs have been historically thought to be tumor-promoting components and to represent a promising target for um, cancer treatment. And so there have been uh, several ways uh, in which um, laboratories uh, and, uh, and the clinicians have been trying to uh, target CAFs. Um, and these are some of the some of the, um, the ways that uh, uh, people have approached this. Um, specifically, uh, people have tried to target uh, ECM components. They have tried to reprogram calves back to quiescence, back to normal fibroblasts. And for example, calcipotrol, atra, and losartan, they have been used uh, uh, both preclinical, preclinically and clinically and still ongoing in clinical trial for pancreatic ca uh, cancer. Uh, there also have been immuno anti immune suppressive strategies, specifically targeting this uh, uh, FAP protein that is expressed by uh, CAFs. And also, there have been a number of, way, uh, of works uh, trying to target specific pathways uh, that are activated in CAS. And uh, several of these inhibitors have also um, uh, been done in, in my previous work. But today I want to uh, focus on two specific examples, which are uh, probably the most famous example in pancreatic cancer. And one of these examples is um, uh, PEG-PH20, which is a hyaluronidase, which is an enzyme that targets HA, hyaluronan, which is one of these extracellular matrix components. And there have been uh, really promising uh, uh, preclinical studies now uh, 10 years ago that showed that uh, uh, targeting HA leads to an increased uh, drug concentration within the tumor. And so, um, uh, clinical trials uh, with uh, PEG-PH20 have, uh, have been uh, uh, carried out in the phase one, phase two, and uh, uh, even phase three clinical trials. And the phase three clinical trial was also interesting because it was one of the first trials for pancreatic cancer that was uh, um, driven by biomarker. And so only HA high patients uh, were actually, actually entered the clinical trial. Um, unfortunately, Still, phase three clinical trial didn't show any didn't show any benefit for the patients, and so the company discontinued the drug, and the, uh, the clinical trial failed. Another example I want to uh, discuss today is the one of submit this. Um, of the hedgehog inhibitor. So smoothen uh, is a, a component of. Uh, uh, the hedgehog signaling pathway, and a number of uh, hedgehog inhibitors have been tested both preclinically and in the clinic. And that's because uh, in the past, especially this study uh, from 2009, uh, showed that uh, targeting hedgehog signaling, which is uh, a pathway that is active uh, in, uh, in the calves, uh, in, pancreatic, uh, in pancreatic cancer, led to depletion of calves reduction of the extracellular matrix, again, increase in drug delivery and uh, um, a better uh, survival in mouse models. However, um, clinical trials miserably failed. So not only there was no benefit for the patients, but actually the patients that were getting the hedgehog inhibitors had a worse prognosis than the patients on the control arm. And so um, following uh, preclinical studies, I tried to find an answer to the failure of these clinical trials and found that prolonged inhibition of the hedgehog signaling pathways was actually deleterious for the mice. And at that time, in 2014, the conclusion of those studies was uh, that uh, uh, targeting CAS in pancreatic cancer is bad because CAS uh, are um, uh, playing a tumor-restraining role. 
But clearly, uh, the results of these preclinical and clinical studies is in contrast with uh, the many functions, the many tumor promoting functions that CAFs play both in pancreatic cancer and in other cancer types. So this shows that uh, we need to have a better understanding of the biology of CAFs so that we can find ways to effectively target them. And so how do we study and model CAFs? Uh, historically, two-dimensional cultures have been used. Um, and we could talk a, a lot about that. There's many caveats of using uh, two-dimensional cultures. But the main caveat is that uh, because of the tension of the plastic, which is really high, the, the highest you can find, you don't find it in, in a pancreatic tumor, uh, it activates a number of signaling pathways, integrin signaling, uh, and so on. That leads to the activation of uh, uh, fibroblasts and the conversion towards a, a highly myofibroblastic phenotype, which uh, historically has been thought to be the uh, calf type. So the increase in myofibroblastic feature was what uh, believed to be a, a universal trait of calves. Um, more recently, three-dimensional cultures are being used, and uh, during my postdoc, I co-developed one of these three-dimensional cultures uh, with organoids, um, which I will uh, tell you a little bit about more in a couple of slides. Um, but there's also a number of other uh, models that are just only uh, recently uh, starting to um, to being used uh, to model CAFs. And for example, uh, last year and this year's uh, new um, genetically engineers mouse models for lineage tracing have been generated. And I think that will tell us a lot about uh, the biology of CAFs. Three-dimensional bioprinted tissues uh, are also being used in which you can um, um, print your uh, little tumors with cancer cell and fibroblasts. But also there are platforms that I think are still underutilized, uh, such as organs on chips and air liquid interface cultures, which are um, um, platforms that are short-term cultures uh, with the fluidics uh, or with other systems that allow us to look at, uh, uh, for example, explants from tumors, uh, and they retain uh, various uh, uh, cell types uh, from the tumor. And this is something that we are interested in developing in the future in the lab. One of the models that we like to work on in the lab are the organoids. Um, and uh, uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons that could be the could seem like the obvious one is that uh, organoids grow in 3D like a tumor. And this might just mean, seem something like fancy to say instead of using a classical 2D culture. But actually, it's important because, as I mentioned, um, the tension of the plastic activates a number of signaling in pathways that you don't necessarily see in the tumors, but also growing on plastic um, uh, destroys the natural polarization of the cells that, that grow as a mass in 3D in your body. So um, organoids grow in 3D. Um, but that's not the only advantage. They are also a very easily um, and quickly manipulated genetically. So you can knock out a gene or overexpress a gene and then um, put your organoids back into the pancreas of a mouse uh, and then look at how uh, the loss of the gain or the gain of that particular protein, uh, how that is affecting pancreatic cancer progression. And that's obviously uh, much quicker than generating generating a mouse models without that gene. And so it's something that uh, might take months or years, uh, now it can take weeks uh, um, uh, to, to, to generate and, and work with them. But also importantly, organoids allow normal versus tumor comparison. This is important because if you want to perform a drug study, you want to know whether your drug is killing every cell or is just selectively killing your cancer cells and not affecting the normal cells. And this is not possible with 2D 
to the cultures because uh, there's no normal and untransformed uh, pancreatic line that you can use and that the grows uh, in 2D. Whereas in organoids, we can grow normal and tumor organoids and even preneoplastic organoids in the same media conditions, in the same matrix, and really be able to compare them. Uh, also, organoids recapitulate the genetic of the primary tissue, and this is important because uh, if you are interested in the uh, epithelial component and the mutational profile of a patient, you can perform DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, copy number variation profile, and have uh, um, your profile, your identity of that particular tumor of the patients. And so this is uh, the basis of precision medicine and why many labs are interested in using organoids for uh, identifying therapies that would work for the patient from which you have derived that specific organoids. However, um, organoids, um, I need to admit this person, <laughs> um, the problem of the organoids is that uh, they are purely epithelial components. So again, if you're interested just in the cancer compartment, it's fantastic because you can think that if you want to look at a very rare mutation, you have a higher chance to see it in a purely epithelial organoid rather than in a piece of tissue from a patient that, as I showed, has 90% of non-cancer components. However, for uh, researchers like us that are interested in looking at the interface between the cancer cells and the non-cancerous components, we do need uh, um, to improve this system. And so for this reason, uh, now a few years ago, we have uh, developed a new three-dimensional co-culture model that allow us to co-culture uh, pancreatic cancer organoids with uh, pancreatic uh, um, uh, stellate cells or with pancreatic fibroblasts. And we grow them in this matrix called matrigel and in growth factor reduced media conditions. And the reason why we use growth factor reduced media conditions is that this allow us to look at the symbiotic interactions between the cancer cells and the fibroblasts and with the cancer cells promoting the activation and the proliferation of the fibroblasts and vice versa with the fibroblasts that promote the uh, proliferation of the organoids. And so by using this uh, uh, model, what we found uh, is that um, they are, uh, the fibroblasts are not actually a monolithic entity as previously thought. They are not a homogeneous population, but they are comprised of at least two main populations. A myofibroblastic or MyCAF population, which is um, uh, based on the transcriptional profile, largely responsible for the deposition of this blue ocean that I showed initially of this extracellular matrix, and that they are typically found adjacent to the cancer cells and other be happy to go into the details of why that is the case. And a second population that is an inflammatory calf population or ICAF population, which is found further away from the cancer cells and have a very different transcriptional profile from the MyCAFs, including the fact that they have low myofibroblastic features. And so the reason why we didn't really see this ICAF population before is because uh, uh, we were using uh, monolayer cultures. Um, and as I mentioned, the contact with the plastic induces uh, uh, by itself uh, myofibroblastic features. And so uh, this is not the only model that we use. We use a combination of models so that we can understand the heterogeneity of the fibroblast. We can understand their mechanism of activation and how they affect the cancer cells. And we can develop therapies that target uh, tumor promoting interactions between the fibroblast and the cancer cells. And so we use genetically engineered mouse models and the tissues from patients to uh, isolate and develop organoids and fibroblasts that we can grow in co-cultures. We're also developing co-cultures with immune cells, neutrophils, T cells, and macrophages. And we combine these models with a variety of techniques such as single cell RNA sequencing and the combinations of uh, RNA scope and immunofluorescence and flow cytometry.
We also put back these organoids and fibroblasts, either as organoids themselves or co-cultures of organoids and fibroblasts. We put them back into the pancreas of a mouse so that we can develop additional models in which we can understand the mechanism and the heterogeneity of these populations. And so using these different models, we have uh, made significant progress in understanding the biology of CAS in pancreatic cancer. We have found that uh, they are heterogeneous and that uh, also in vivo in human patient samples and the mouse models, as we found in our co-culture system, in our very simple co-culture system, still we found that ICAFs and MICAFs are the main state, the, the larger, largest populations of CAS in pancreatic cancer. Uh, and interestingly, what we found is that they can interconvert depending on the signaling pathways uh, that you are inhibiting. We found also a third smaller uh, set of CAS uh, that we called antigen presenting CAS uh, uh, that we think might have a different origin and perhaps a mesothelial cell of origin rather than a purely fibroblastic origin. The majority of my postdoctoral studies focused on understanding what pathways are activated in ICAS and MICAS and what are the ligands that cancer cells secrete to induce these phenotypes. And the idea is that the more we understand about the signaling pathways, the, um, the more tools we have to selectively target these populations and understand their function and design combination therapies that will be effective for patients. We found that ICAFs are responsible in recruiting immunosuppressive populations uh, such as neutrophils in a specific subtype of pancreatic cancer, so-called adenosquamous subtype. And we found that, uh, of course, uh, TGF-beta is not the only um, ligand important for MICAFs. It's the main driver of MICAF formation, but there are other pathways that are important for MICAF maintenance. And one of these pathways, interestingly, is the hedgehog signaling pathway. So sonic hedgehog is secreted by the cancer cells and activates hedgehog signaling in the calves. And as I mentioned before, it was thought that hedgehog signaling was a pathway that was active in calves in pancreatic cancer in general, and that targeting hedgehog signaling would lead to a depletion, an overall depletion of calves and to this poor prognosis. As a consequence, um, the conclusion was that targeting calves is not a good strategy. However, what we found is recently is that uh, um, actually hedgehog signaling is not equally activated in all calf subtypes. It's preferentially activated in the MICAF subtype. And when we target hedgehog signaling with a specific inhibitor, we find uh, that MICAFs are targeted, but ICAFs actually increase so that you have uh, a difference in ratio between the ICAF and MICAF population. And so perhaps uh, since uh, we uh, believe that an ICAFs play tumor promoting roles in the microenvironment of pancreatic cancer, perhaps targeting hedgehog signaling pathway is not leading to a poor prognosis uh, because it's targeting a tumor restraining calf population, but it's because it's shifting the, um, uh, the presence of calves from a more myofibroblastic population to a more inflammatory tumor promoting population. And this again stresses how it's important to understand what pathways are activated in the calves and what our drugs are doing to the overall tumor microenvironment. And so uh, I really like signaling pathways and mechanisms, and we have now found another uh, signaling pathways that is important uh, um, in my case, uh, and that uh, is a pathway that is not necessarily uh, thought to be activated in the calves, and yet we found it's differentially activated. And again, it's a reminder that uh, um, we need as researchers and as clinicians to to know more about our tumors and how they would respond from uh, to uh, therapies. 
So now we know that fibroblasts are heterogeneous and they are plastic in pancreatic cancer. Um, but it's not that's not the end because actually our work started the whole uh, field and uh, uh, now it's really clear that in a number of malignancies, fibroblasts are highly heterogeneous. And that was something that had been previously overlooked because uh, we were using um, not the best models perhaps, but also because we didn't have uh, the single cell omics technologies that are now available and that show that uh, this, uh, com th this complexity of, of fibroblast uh, uh, heterogeneity. And the interesting thing is that the, um, the subtypes that we found in pancreatic cancer and the ligands that identify that are responsible for inducing this inflammatory and myofibroblastic calf subtypes, well, it turns out that those uh, subtypes and signaling pathways are also very relevant in other malignancies, which shows how understanding the, um, the biology of the microenvironment in pancreatic cancer can be used as a paradigm to understand biology in other malignancies and have a big impact. And of course, there's uh, many questions that are uh, unanswered. We answered some of some questions, but actually the uh, answers we gave opened so many additional ones. And some of these questions are being currently uh, investigated. Um, there's uh, more interest now in understanding what is the cell of origin of calves in pancreatic cancer, but also other malignancies. And so lineage tracing mouse models is one of the ways uh, that laboratories are trying to, um, to find this cell of origin of different calf subtypes, uh, which might um, indicate how we can prevent perhaps uh, the, um, uh, the development of a specific tumor promoting uh, calf subtype. But also, um, uh, there is a question of whether there is uh, similarities across malignancy. What's the level of uh, similarities? There are universality of calf subtypes. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, a paper in Nature has shown that, yes, it seems that there are at least two universal fibroblast populations that then go on to differentiate in different fibroblast subtypes and contribute to different calf subtype populations across the very different tissues. In the lab, we are very much interested in understanding how calves are different from normal fibroblasts and also from uh, fibroblasts in fibrotic inflammatory diseases because there's, there's a, a lot of uh, similarities and we want to understand uh, uh, what is uh, tumor specific and specific to a malignant context and what is instead specific of a diseased inflammatory context. We're also interested in understanding what are the basis of calf plasticity because we want to be able to perhaps prevent this plasticity or um, leverage it to try, um, you know, convert a tumor promoting subtype into a tumor restraining one. And then we still have to nail what are the functions of these calf subtypes. There's a lot of speculation, and this is mostly based on uh, pharmacological studies. But of course, these studies uh, um, are not uh, very, um, very neat because you would target other subtypes, uh, cancer cells, immune cells, and also because you might um, convert a subtype A to a subtype B with that strategy. So it would be really hard to um, determine whether the phenotype you're observing is due to the loss of subtype A or due to the enrichment of subtype B. And that's kind of what we see for uh, the hedgehog signaling uh, story. And then finally, we still need to uh, determine uh, therapies that are effective and that will target specific calf subtypes or perhaps specific features of specific calf subtypes so that we can develop combination uh, therapies. So in the lab, we are, um, uh, our goal is to decode fibroblast biology to develop new therapies and trying to address some of the questions uh, that I showed in the previous slide. And so, for example, Eloise in the lab is looking at how the mutational profile, the genetics of the cancer cells is affecting fibroblast heterogeneity. 
And that's because there are emerging evidence that the mutational profile of cancer cells can affect the tumor microenvironment. And our idea is to be able to uh, combine a cancer-specific signature with a fibroblast signature so that we can better stratify patients for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. And we also still need to understand what are the function of these caps. And Priscilla is going to take this challenge on by developing new mouse models and co-culture models that will prevent this plasticity and this interconversion and will allow us to determine what are the functions of these different subtypes and to identify new targets for clinical evaluation. And then while uh, all of these projects will, in the end, uh, hopefully converge to the development of new combination therapies, uh, probably Joaquin's project is the one that is most directly related to this, uh, as he's working on uh, uh, trying to understand what's the effect of aging on fibroblasts and the microenvironment and how that impacts the cancer cells. And that's important because, as I mentioned, the majority of patients are older patients, and we don't really model aging in our, in our systems. And so the idea is that perhaps including these uh, uh, major risk factors and, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, actually feature of pancreatic cancer patients will allow us to understand new biology that so far we haven't been able to grasp. So overall, uh, the, um, the uh, scope of the lab is to um, understand the fundamental mechanistic biology so that we can eventually translate it into the clinic, clinic and hopefully being able to raise that purple bars that I, I showed you at the beginning uh, of, uh, in that um, quite depressing graph and I think there's no other way to put it. There's other uh, questions that we are working on in the lab and um, my picture is the only one missing from the previous slide. So there's quite a lot uh, that we are working with. So we're always looking for excited people to join. And we're uh, working on, uh, as I mentioned, understanding um, how inflammation and cancer are different. You might have heard that cancer is this um, uh, wound that never heals. And that's very much true and definitely for the uh, tumor microenvironment. And you may or may not know that pancreatitis, which is an inflammatory condition of the, of the pancreas, is one of the major risk factors of pancreatic cancer. And uh, if you look at a human pancreatic pancreatitis samples and um, pancreatic cancer can be really hard to distinguish them because they're both uh, uh, characterized by the loss of the acinar structures and by this very extensive uh, uh, extracellular matrix deposition and fibrotic microenvironment. We're interested in understanding the metabolism of CAS and how they are different in different CAS subtypes, how fibroblast heterogeneity changes during PDAP progression, so uh, how similar the microenvironment of a primary tumor is uh, from secondary metastatic um, tumors. And um, the fact that we want to understand this is because the majority of uh, uh, knowledge we have about fibroblasts is related to the primary tumors. But actually, the disease that we need to uh, treat in the patients is, as I mentioned, largely a metastatic disease. And so are we uh, using the right models uh, to find uh, drugs that are actually going to be effective and translatable into the clinic? Therapeutic targets is uh, something that hopefully all of the projects that we're working on uh, will uh, lead us to. But there are other questions that we're interested in. Um, we, uh, in the end, what we want to have is uh, almost like a holistic understanding of the tumor. I think that, uh, I hope that I showed you how complex the microenvironment is. And the more we understand about the interactions between the cancer cells, the fibroblasts and immune cells, the better we can develop combination strategies that will allow us uh, to, um, to be successful. I don't think that for pancreatic cancer, we're going to have uh, this called the bullet. I think it's going to be a cocktail of drugs that's going to be effective uh, for the patients. 
And finally, how can we translate the knowledge that we have gathered by study pancreatic cancer to other diseases, other malignancies, but also inflammatory conditions that are that have no cure. Pancreatitis is a horrible condition and doesn't have a cure. And there's a lot of similarities between pancreatic cancer and pancreatitis. So can we uh, go outside of our field and uh, uh, learn from other fields and similarly um, bring our knowledge to, to those fields. And so with this, I'm going to uh, conclude. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, as you can imagine, it was an interesting uh, year to start a lab. Um, thanks to the pandemic, I decided today not to have my um, toilet, uh, toilet paper roll uh, background. And I, I did use it last year in a conference. And believe me or not, uh, um, the majority of people thought that it was real. And I think this tells us a lot about the state of 2020 and uh, and how how that changed us but um thank you very much and i'm very happy to take any questions if you have any grazie giulia per la presentazione molto interessante e molto chiara e se qualcuno ha delle domande può attivare il microfono oppure scriverle in chat e non siate timidi. Altrimenti io Giulia avevo una domanda magari per iniziare. Preferisci in italiano o in inglese? No, no, vai in italiano. Poi magari io ti rispondo in inglese. <ride> um, volevo sapere se si sa come uh, le cellule del cancro riescono a indurre il fenotipo CAF nei fibroblasti. Yes, so that actually was um, really the focus of my of my lab, uh, not of my lab, of my postdoc, um, and I just brushed through it. Uh, uh, but basically, what I found is that TGF beta, uh, secreted by the cancer cells, is the main driver of the mica subtype, and so induces uh, uh, the micas, and IL one is inducing the ICAS. And um, there is, you, you might wonder why this happens. So uh, if you remember when I showed the co-culture, I said that the MICAFs are found adjacent to the cancer cells and the ICAFs are found further away. So the idea is that uh, if, you are, if you are a fibroblast around the cancer cells and you uh, receive uh, TGF beta secreted, uh, secreted by the cancer cells, you become a MICAF. And that's because I showed that uh, uh, TGF beta downregulates the expression of the IL1 receptor. And so basically, you do not, even if IL1 is there, you cannot respond to it. And so the MICAF is kind of like um, TGF beta is like the dominant signaling pathway that acts as a break and prevents ICAF formation. However, if you're further away from the cancer cells, TGF beta, uh, it, which uh, has a gradient from the cancer cells, doesn't get to the ICAFs to the fibroblasts there, which still have TGF beta receptor, but TGF beta is not there, so the break is not there. So IL-1 can induce uh, um, uh, a signaling cascade of events, which I can bore you with the details so through leaf, uh, leads to the induction of JAK-STAT signaling, which leads to an upregulation of a number of cytokines, such as CXL12, CXL1, CSF3, and so on, which have been shown to be immunosuppressive and, and tumor promoting. So this is the mechanism, and that's why it's the localization of fibroblasts is also important to determining their phenotype. Grazie. Beatrice, una domanda? Sì, esatto. Um, parlo anch'io in italiano ormai. E innanzitutto ringrazio molto la dottoressa Biffi per uh, questo intervento che è stato molto stimolante. In particolare avrei una domanda riguardo a questi organoidi fatti, se ho capito bene, da diversi tipi cellulari. Potrebbero dare delle indicazioni son, eh, o sono già stati usati per trarre delle informazioni riguardo alla farmacocinetica di potenziali farmaci, ehm, perché so ad esempio che nei tumori solidi poi non so esattamente nel caso del pancreas che l'assorbimento non è sempre semplice. Yeah, so 
Um, so there is a really nice cancer discovery paper from 2018 from uh, Dave's lab, Dave Tuveson lab, which is my postdoctoral advisor, in which basically they isolated a number of organoids from patients and uh, uh, treated with a number of therapies. And what they found uh, um, was that uh, the um, uh, organoids were not always sensitive, uh, uh, all sensitive to those drugs. Uh, and this is important because uh, 2D cell lines, for example, are very sensitive to chemotherapies, and that's also why they are really not a good model to study that, and we can discuss why they're so sensitive. But the organoids, uh, um, they have been shown they were perhaps, uh, let's say, sensitive to gemcitabine, and what they found was that the patient uh, sensitivity was recapitulated in the organoids. Of course, uh, what you're asking is also related to does the drug get to, to the tumor. For the organoids, uh, um, there's not the stroma, which is one of the barriers to drug delivery. So the organoids would not recapitulate that. They recapitulate the um, intrinsic sensitivity of the cancer cells to the drug. The co-cultures would do that, and we're interested in doing drug screens in co-cultures because of that. Uh, mouse models are also used for that, but of course, I mean, there's no perfect mouse model. There's no perfect model, right? It, it's the combination of models that in the end will allow it to infer whether uh, a drug is good or not for that particular patient. Chiarissima, grazie mille. I also have a check question. Um, I speak in English, Julia. Many thanks, first of all, for the great presentation. And I, I have actually two questions. One is very naive, is about, um, so when, when the, pancreas, the pancreatic cancer basically cells become metastatic, they are also like still calf dependent. So the, you know, the metastasis is, is you know, driven by some specific calf. And if so, if there is any specificity in a specific organ, basically, or it's mm -hmm. spread around. And then I ask a second question later. <laughs> okay, yeah, great, okay. thanks. Uh, because then I never remember the first one. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so very good. Um, yeah, that's a great question. That actually is one that we are trying to answer in the lab. And we think that now with the new um, uh, cell lines and mouse models that we generated for Priscilla's project, we will be able to address that. So now we have ways in which we can transplant fibroblasts that are already in a calf state and they cannot interconvert into the other state. And something I can tell you is that we know that uh, calves can co-migrate with the cancer cells to secondary uh, um, sites to metastasis. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, uh, is there a particular calf subtype that will allow to better metastasize uh, and that will uh, uh, co-migrate with the cancer cells and allow the cancer cells to colonize the secondary organ? In terms of uh, sites specificity in pancreatic cancer, liver is one of the main uh, sites and you can perhaps uh, uh, appreciate why because there is, you know, pancreatic duct. And so uh, it's uh, the main, um, the major secondary sites, but you can also get uh, lung mats uh, um, and um, in the mouse model, so peri peritoneum, um, peritoneal mats and diaphragm mats. All right, many thanks. It's, it's super interesting. And actually, the second question is completely irrelevant, actually. I'm, I'm working out immunity. And when you say this connection between pancreatitis and cancer, it's very, very interesting. And I actually was one of the very stupid questions. What happens if a pancreatic cancer become basically infected by a virus or, or bacteria? If there is any, <laughs> you know, it activates probably the I1 release, as you were saying. So I don't know if there is any... Okay, um, I'm not sure I know enough about this, but I can tell you microbiome, everyone is excited about microbiome now. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, definitely, I don't know how much is um, there out, out there about pancreatic cancer. I think not so much. I know people are working on it, uh, but there is a connection between uh, uh, microbiome and and. And, uh, and the cancer malignancy, some seem protective, some not protective, some just associated this so, uh, correlation rather than causality. I don't know about, um, you know, viral infection and, uh, um, and uh, um, bacteria infection, but what I can tell you is that inflammation 
uh, is a major driver of pancreatic cancer. Like uh, people use uh, uh, in, in, induction of pancreatitis in mouse models to accelerate pancreatic cancer progression. And there's a, a paper in Science published uh, two years ago, I think, um, also from Dave's lab that uh, shows that uh, um, pancreatitis or CA99, I don't know if you know about CA99, it's a um, marker that is used for pancreatic cancer, not detection, but to um, follow therapy response. They've shown mm -hmm. that CA99 induces pancreatitis and that's accelerate pancreatic cancer. And there's also a number of other mouse models that show pancreatic, pancreatitis and inflammation is uh, important for pancreatic cancer and also true in all other malignancies. I mean, if inflammation is a major driver of malignancy in general. I mean, think about gastric cancer, colon cancer, right? All those uh, IBDs yeah. and and the relation with um, with um, with colon cancer. Yeah, yeah. I don't and know answer to. <laughs> no, I know, I know it's uh, yeah, it's a, a crazy word out there about that, I, and I I totally understand. <laughs> Many thanks, Julia. I don't get these nice questions in actual conferences. I feel like you guys are asking good questions. Se qualcun altro ha ancora delle domande, non faccia il timido. Se no, Giulia, io avevo una domanda un po' più personale di interesse, e cioè come sei passata da fare ricerca sul DNA al pancreas perché spesso a noi studenti sembra che l'ambito in cui ti specializzi inizialmente ti accompagnerà per sempre e invece volevo sapere un po' la tua storia ecco. Can I see you speak in English? Thanks. Um, yes, so I always tell everyone, my students, but also not students, don't, don't get fixated like we, uh, you can always change and I think what you should do is do what you want to do like find something that really inspires you and then it might be a bit trickier at the beginning but it's totally doable but basically what happened is uh, that i mean i can tell you like a quick uh, quick story um when i was in pavia i was working on telomeres and telomeres and at the time i thought mm, telomeres uh, uh, targeting that's gonna be it's gonna cure every cancer um, and so I went to Cambridge uh, with one of those scholarships uh, for St. John's College uh, during my first and second year of my, of my master. Uh, because there was a, a laboratory um, of Sir Shankar Balazubramanian that was working on telomerase. Um, and uh, um, he was very interested in, in telomeres. And one of the structures of telomeres is G-quadruplexes, because these are structures that form in GRH uh, sequences. And so I, of course, as a, as a student, I go to Cambridge and I was so nice uh, research there. Everything was so much faster. So I decided to go back to, for my PhD. And initially uh, we wanted to find a um, project that was uh, complementary to our interests. And so actually my first publication was on a specific telomeric protein that binds to G-quadruplexes. Uh, but then uh, um, he was more interested in trying to understand uh, um, to the G-quadruplexes in particular, and he's a chemist. Uh, so at that time, G-quadruplexes, yeah, they come up in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in vitro, but we didn't quite know whether they were there in the human cells and whether there was any connection with cancer. Uh, and uh, um, we were in a cancer research institute. We are in a cancer research institute. I mean, I did my PhD where I'm now. <laughs> so that's funny. Um, and, and so as a biology, I was like, well, I mean, we are studying these structures. We don't know if they are in the human cells. And so we decided to develop a tool that uh, turned out to be a single chain fragment antibody to recognize the structures in human cells. And this was great and I loved it and it was a great experience and I wouldn't be back if I didn't enjoy my PhD in Cambridge. Um, but I, my interest was, has always been cancer biology and I always had kind of the urge of doing something more translational. And so I decided to go to Cold Spring Harbor to tackle this, um, you know, horrible cancer type. 
and I really enjoyed my research there and the uh, and the appreciating uh, uh, the complexity of the microenvironment and how really we need to understand communication between cell types because otherwise if you study cancer cells if you study macrophages we're not going to go anywhere and so my goal is try to you know collaborate communicate uh, as uh, the cell types do in the tumor and try to uh, to do something that is actually impactful and so um yes change you know if something inspires you and you think that you can contribute to a different field do it and i also think to be honest that having two very different experiences was great because it gives me a point of view that is different i mean i do believe that my interest um, in uh, uh, understanding the step-by-step -step mechanism of things is linked to the fact that I was in a chemist lab, chemistry lab in which uh, you appreciate that almost at the molecular DNA level, it's important to understand that uh, aspect uh, to you know, look at the bigger picture. And so I, I think it's great to change. It was a bit long, sorry. Grazie <laughs> mille. Allora, se non ci sono ulteriori domande, ringraziamo Giulia veramente per la presentazione e per le risposte a tutte le domande che ti abbiamo fatto. E, e niente, auguriamo una buona serata a tutti. Grazie.